more than anything, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. As Linda said, I am uh, Dr. Nathaniel Pitchell. I am a, uh, actually I've shifted positions. I am a uh, research associate here at Dartmouth College as well. So uh, on behalf of the uh, Dartmouth Department of Anthropology and the Dartmouth Archaeology Working Group, I would like to welcome you all today to uh, the 2024 Spring New Hampshire Archaeological Society meetings. Introduce our, our first speaker of the day, uh, uh, Dr. Alexander Garcia Putnam, uh, currently a uh, postdoc at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, Dr. Garcia Putnam is a bioarchaeologist that's interested in uh, inequality in death, um, in, inequality in life, inequality in death, concepts of necroviolence, uh, and uh, other aspects uh, of uh, other aspects of uh, subaltern communities, uh, both in life and death. He has conducted research. He has research interests in Peru, uh, as well as Louisiana, where he's worked on the collections of Charity Hospital. He's now turned his attention uh, to similar themes here in the state of New Hampshire. Today, if I'm not mistaken, talking yep. about the uh, the Brentwood Cemetery. Uh, without further ado, one hopes uh, Dr. Alexander Garcia Putnam or Alex. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that introduction. That was uh, that was wonderful. Um, and thank you guys all for coming to hear me speak this morning. I'm glad to be the first speaker. Um, glad I'm going to you know kick things off. Hopefully, I'll keep things interesting. Um, I've got a lot to talk about. Those of you that know me know that I love to talk, so I'm going to try to keep this brief. Um, but today, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, actually the first project that I got involved with when I moved to um, the University of New Hampshire. So. I started as a postdoc this past fall, so I'm relatively new to New Hampshire. I'm still learning, uh, still learning the state, still getting my feet under me. But um, thankfully, um, you know, some of my friends and colleagues like uh, Nathaniel and, and his wife Heather have been great at introducing me around uh, New Hampshire, and it's been it's been wonderful to be here. Um, so today, as I said, I'm going to be talking to you guys about a um, a set of um, skeletal remains and my analysis of those remains from the Brentwood Poor Farm. Uh, so Brentwood is in Rockingham County, um, about 35 minutes west of uh, Durham, right, uh, west of UNH, um, where I'm at now. Um, so recently, bioarchaeologists have become really interested in exploring the lives and deaths of individuals or populations that have been omitted from, from kind of dominant historical narratives. Um, within this larger focus, there's been this um, kind of specialization by a number of folks on this idea of institutionalization and how individuals placed within the care of the state, both willingly and unwillingly, might might show those impacts on their skeletal remains. Um, right, uh, Individuals in institutions such as prisons, mental asylums, uh, indigent hospitals, poor farms, poor houses, um, they're generally not included in those historical dominant historical narratives. And so it's my job as a bioarchaeologist to try to Kind of bring their story back and to try to help tell that story. I can't, I'm not the perfect person to tell that story, but I'm going to do what I can through the skills that I have to, to kind of help, um, help fill that in a little bit. Um, right. So bioarchaeologists can directly observe the implications of institutionalization, marginalization on human bodies, right? The violence, the hardships people faced, the stressors accompanied with poverty and otherness. Right? They all manifest in skeletal and dental tissues. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to talk about, um, let me rephrase. Um, so this type of work is also kind of a stark reminder of how we treat these types of individuals today, right? Unhoused individuals, migrants, in individuals with disabilities. Um, so, you know, while I'm giving you this talk, there's some unfortunate reminders of, of kind of today's today's society. So um, not super cheery to begin the morning, I'm sorry, um, but um, welcome to being inside my head. Um, so um, as you can imagine, as a bioarchaeologist and as bioarchaeology talk, there will be images of human skeletal remains uh, in this presentation. Um, I have the support of the local community of interest, uh, including the landowner where these remains were found, uh, including the local historical society, and as well as the um, working with the state on this project. So, um, I, and I feel I feel pretty strongly that um, the images I am showing are for a reason. I don't show human skeletal remains as some sort of oddity or um, kind of look how neat this is. The idea is so we can have a better understanding of these individuals and their lives. So, 
uh, with the kind of that, um, you know, message aside, I'd like to go ahead and get going. Um, before we get into the Brentwood poor farm itself, I want to take you guys through a little bit about um, a little bit about poor farms in general across the United States. Um, so the poor farm system, the poor house system, the workhouse idea, this was really common uh, in the United States and Europe um, from the mid 1600s to the mid 1900s, but it really saw its Haiti in the 1800s. Um, and there was this massive increase in the 1800s of impoverished individuals um, and governments from local governments to national governments were tasked to find a solution. And poor farms, poor houses uh, were facilities that were meant to house the poor, house the elderly, the disabled, and others considered in the language of the time unwelcome in normal society. Um, you can see from the quote at the top there um, that in the words of the time, there were the worthy poor, that these individuals were potentially uh, individuals who couldn't work for themselves, whether they were disabled or elderly. And then there was also the unworthy poor, right, the paupers. Um, they were seeing, seen as kind of less deserving of social assistance. Um, so communities and charitable organizations built these poor farms, these almshouses, to act as this kind of welfare endeavor. Um, these spaces also acted as a place to keep marginalized individuals kind of out of view of the middle and upper classes. Um, there was disdain and derision toward the less fortunate. Um, you know, this is an unfortunate trend, but I, I think very much continues today. Um, and, and we see that in, you know, hospitalizations. We certainly saw that over COVID. Um, and we, you know, hopefully through this research, we can begin to have some sort of better understanding and maybe a little bit more empathy. Um, so facilities like this were exceedingly common in the United States, as I said, particularly in the 19th century, especially in the po more populous northern states. Um, early industrialization was kind of getting underway in the United States. So there was this increase in non-skilled labor in, or increase in non-skilled jobs. Um, an increased number of laborers were needed, and therefore there was a resultant decrease in wages for those individuals. Um, yay, capitalism. So um, when work was available, it was often seasonal, it was often difficult, and it was often dangerous and done for exceedingly low pay, right? This uh, states began to grapple with this uh, this kind of huge scale of poverty, and some individuals in some states actually began to see this as a social issue that required a governmental fix. And again, that fix was this proliferation of government or government run or government assisted alms houses or poor houses. Um, so poverty was always the thread that connected those that were forced into these facilities. Um, but their marginalization was often this kind of interwoven web of poverty, race, ethnicity, mental or physical illness, right? All these things, but but poverty was that through line, right? These, these poor farms offered room and board um, in exchange for labor. Um, and the treatment of the individuals uh, who were housed at these facilities, often called inmates, um, they were, it varied dramatically from uh, poor farm to poor farm, and even very dramatically within a given poor farm, depending on who the overseer was. Um, sometimes it was exploitative and sometimes it was downright violent. Um, so again, um, while these poor farms function to kind of help these local um, individuals kind of get back on their feet, if you will, it was also absolutely central to local economic, local food production. Um, so they were very much a part of these communities as well. Um, individuals would not stay at almshouses very long. The typical stay was only about two weeks. Uh, the exception to that rule was the very cold New England winters. People would often stay there for much longer periods of time uh, over the winter. Um, so there was a general trend from the 1600s to the 1900s when the system faded out um, from much more violent treatment, things like harsh punishments, including whippings. Um, and But that, that slowly phased out to these so quote unquote less severe punishments and less severe treatment. Uh, this still included isolation. And one example I read, it was isolation in a pest house that was used for smallpox quarantine. So yeah, less violent, right? Um, right, there, uh, these were still, you know, physically and emotionally taxing, not trivial, 
violence in some form was always a part of this system. So now I'd like to turn you guys' attention to the Brentwood poor farm itself. Um, so Brentwood, the town, was founded in 1742 um, after it kind of uh, dissolved from the nearby town of Exeter. Um, the the rocky sediments and the bad soils made challenge made farming kind of a challenge, and the town grew really slowly. It's not a very big town to this day. Um, given the hardships of life in the region at the time, families and communities really stuck together. Um, despite really helpful neighbors and communities, right? Some individuals obviously didn't have the resources to weather things like serious illness or injury um, or old age or sporadic or permanent unemployment. So the town um, started thinking about a way to help those, those poor individuals. Uh, so in 1763, the town voted to build a workhouse and then nothing happened. And then later on in 1821, again, the town voted and they were like, yes, we're gonna do it. And then nothing happened. Um, and then finally in uh, 1838, the town legislature decided enough was enough and they, they put their money where their mouth is. And in 1841, uh, they purchased a building for $2,800, so about the same as housing prices now. Mm -hmm. um, and it began functioning as the town poorhouse and a farm built up around it. Um, so as you guys can see from some of these archival sources, we have, we have a lot of archival materials about the poor farm, but all of it is economic. There's very little about the individuals that were housed at this poor farm, very little about daily life. It was all dollars and cents. Um, so the Brentwood Poor Farm operated, as I said, from 1841 to 1868. So not a very long uh, lifespan, right? Um, and the reason it shut down in 1868 was because the um, the town was um, the town needed money that it had accrued a bunch of debts during the Civil War and it needed to pay off that uh, debt. And so part of that was selling off the poor farm to private ownership. Um, and then the poor farm responsibilities around this time also started shifting to the county. So it shifted to the Rockingham County uh, poor farm. So um, you guys might notice a familiar face in this in this slide. Um, the mustache was better. It was a good mustache. Um, so this brings me to kind of where I started in this project. So um, as I said, I showed up at the University of New Hampshire um, this past August, um, and we had just received um, a large collection of, of skeletal remains. Um, and my, um, my colleagues were like, hey, you know, as a historical, historical bioarchaeologist, we think this would be a great project for you. So I started kind of doing some digging into it. And I learned that this, these remains have actually been around for some time. Um, so in 1999, um, these remains were actually uncovered. And um, so I, I should I should take a step back. So the poor farm passed into private ownership uh, during the 1900s, um, and it, it remains uh, in private ownership to this day. And there's no kind of visible signs of that poor farm anymore. Um, there's no standing buildings. Um, and then the interest of my talk, there's also no um, sense that there was a cemetery at this poor farm. Um, no grave markers, no fence around it, nothing like that. So in 1999, the homeowner was uh, digging fill to um, sell as construction fill, right? Very normal thing to do, dig a big pit, sell it, people can use it for construction. So take a backhoe, dig a hole, put all the dirt in a truck, ship, the, uh, ship that dirt over to new fields, dump it out on a small uh, residential construction project. And if you were a kid like me, you did exactly what these two young boys did. They started playing in the dirt pile. And what did they find? But a bunch of bones. Um, at first, they thought they were animal remains. And they started collecting them. They said, how neat. And then um, they found a skull. Um, and those of you that know even very little about the human body know it's pretty recognizable, right? Um, and so they, um, they immediately did what they should have done and called the police. Um, so they called the police. And the police came out. Um, and they uh, started interviewing folks and started talking to the um, the original landowner or the landowner from the original uh, site. And they um, they quickly no uh, noted that the landowner had no knowledge that there was a burial ground on their property, anything like that. 
Um, as I said, all of that infrastructure was gone. Um, so uh, the New Hampshire State Archaeologist's Office responded out to site to help the uh, to help the the police, um, and it was determined that the remains were historic. Uh, there was some coffin materials present, and the condition of the remains just they didn't look at all forensic. So the police could take a big breath, but then now it's into the you know the state archaeologist's hands to to get some work done on this. Um, and they did some background research and found that there was indeed this pauper's burial ground uh, in the area. And so it was, these remains became officially associated with the Brentwood Poor Farm. Um, so the remains were turned over to the medical examiner's office. Um, and unfortunately through a, you know, a series of events that is, uh, that is all too common, they ended up kind of staying there for 23 years. Um, and they ended up collecting dust and people changed jobs and people never really understood what those boxes in the back were. Um, until um, folks from my lab went for another, um, went to the medical examiner's office to help them with another case and said, hey, what are those? And the story kind of came out and we, um, so I'm, I'm one of the co-directors of the Forensic Anthropology Identification and Recovery Lab at UNH. I am not a forensic anthropologist, as you can tell, I'm a historical bioarchaeologist. Um, and so when I arrived, my colleague said, hey, this is the perfect project for you, right? This totally makes sense. It works with your skill sets. And hopefully you can make some headway on figuring out who these individuals were and, and what we should do with them. So um, that's really where my section of the story started. Um, and the first thing I did was realize that the bones were incredibly commingled. Um, and incredibly fragmentary. Right? They were excavated with a backhoe. These weren't excavated by an archaeologist. Um, and they've sat in a box in storage for 22 years. Right? Things were not going well for these individuals' remains. Um, so myself and my students, uh, we worked using kind of standard osteological and bioarchaeological um, methods to reassociate the remains and try to put these individuals back together. Um, there was incredible variation in the condition of the remains. Um, uh, clearly some different taphonomic things going on. Some of them appeared to have been water-worn. Some of them appeared to have a little sun bleaching. So using uh, this variation in taphonomy, as well as variation in some of the pathological conditions we saw in the bones, as well as kind of basic element size and form, right? If you have a femur this long and a femur this long, they probably don't belong to the same person. Um, and then also various age and sex markers on those remains, we were able to kind of partition them out into individuals. And as you can see here, this is one of our individuals. They're not very complete even still. Um, so we did what we could, um, but at the end of the day, th this was a really challenging set of remains. It was about 150 fragments. Um, and through our analysis, we figured out that it, that represents a minimum of nine individuals. Um, so. We did a, a pretty nice job, but again, there's just at, at some point we reached the limits of our um, our ability to kind of put these people back together. Um, of those nine individuals, uh, eight of them are adults, mostly middle and older adults. That's 35 and older, um, as well as um, one subadult. Interestingly, we had one fragment of one person under the age of seven. Um, so really almost no analysis could be done uh, on that individual, but it does increase our minimum number. Of those adults, two of them are female or probable female, and three of them are male or probable male, leading to, if my math is correct, three other people that we could not um, I, uh, estimate sex on. And I'm saying sex here, right? This is biological sex, not uh, the concept of gender, which is much, much, much more complicated uh, in the bioarchaeological record, uh, if not often impossible. So. Um, I also should mention that we did not do ancestry estimation on these individuals, um, although the prevailing historical um, kind of narrative and documentation from the time suggests that the vast majority of individuals in this poor farm system were Euro-American. Um, and nothing we saw um, in the remains let us believe anything other than that as well. So um, I now want to turn to um, some of the pathological conditions, some of the um, some of the um, signs of poor health that we saw in these individuals. And I and um, but before we do that, I wanted to share with you guys, this is the skeletal sample. Um, so again, only nine individuals. Um, 
And you can see kind of an interesting pattern in the remains if you read down this list quickly. We've got a lot of cranial and, and vertebra um, from a number of individuals, and then some lower limbs of some other individuals. And my thinking is that they cut diagonally across um, a series of burials. Um, given that we have a lot of upper, um, given the fact that we have a lot of kind of the upper half of many individuals. So again, you can see here, we were able to do um, some generalized age at death estimations as well as some biological sex estimations, but um, a lot of it, given the fragmentation and given the um, and, and given the commingling, these are estimates and these are not great estimates, right? It's the best we can do with the with the um, provided information or you know provided skeletal data that we had. So I now want to turn to some of those signs of poor health. Um, one of the big questions I had is, can we see on these individuals' remains, can we see the signs of their marginalization, the signs of their institutionalization in this poor farm? Um, and unfortunately, the answer is very much yes, we can. Um, so um, one of the first things that I noticed when I looked at these remains was just how severe the osteoarthritis uh, was present on these remains. So degenerative joint diseases like osteoarthritis are the result of joint dysfunction from trauma, overuse, other conditions that are kind of, um, that can impact that, the, the use of that joint. And it often presents as lipping on the joint surface or porosity of the joint surface. And I'll show you guys some examples of that here. Um, when osteoarthritis progresses uh, to a, a further state, you can actually lose all soft tissue between two bones, um, causing bone-on-bone -bone contact. That's so-called ebernation, and I'll show you guys an example of that here in a minute as well. Um, and you can actually get polishing of those remains as they rub together, or grooves as those remains rub together. Uh, the furthest stage of this kind of degenerative joint disease is when the elements actually end up fusing together. So you have bone-on-bone -bone contact, and they end up actually becoming a single element. Um, so here you can see a relatively healthy looking vertebra. Uh, this is an anatomical specimen that I pulled off the internet. You can see no visible signs of that pitting or lipping. Um, here are two cervical vertebra from the Brentwood sample. Um, you can see, yeah, you can see some pitting on that joint surface and you can also see a lot of extra bony growth going on on these articular surfaces. Um, again, that's caused bone on bone contact. That's the, that bone on bone contact. You can also see it when we look at the um, when we look at the top of the those same two cervical vertebrae. A lot of extra bony growth. Um, that would have been very severe osteoarthritis. Now, this same individual um, also has this. Uh, these are the C6 and C7. Um, so this is the, your lowest two neck vertebra right before your ribs start articulating, so right down in here. Um, and those were completely fused together on that left side. Um, the next two vertebra, the top two thoracic vertebra, will also fuse together. Um, so that would have completely limited this individual's ability to, to have kind of upper back mo up mobility. So really, really, really brutal sign of, of what could be a very hard life. Now, if you remember, I, I mentioned that a lot of these individuals are, are middle to older adults. Osteoarthritis can also be a sign of old age. But seeing it this severely, I think it's very clearly uh, the kind of intersection of their advanced age and their, um, and their lived experience at this poor farm. So um, very, very severe. I've actually never seen, in my years of doing this kind of bioarchaeology, I've never seen osteoarthritis this widespread and this severe. Um, so five of five individuals with vertebral remains had severe osteoarthritis. Um, very few other joint surfaces existed in the skeletal sample, um, thanks to the backhoe. Um, they're, they're kind of softer areas of bone, and they often will uh, be the first to degrade or break down or break if you hit it with something like a shovel or a backhoe. Um, so we had few other signs of osteoarthritis because we had few other joint surfaces. Um, we did have one individual's hand and wrist bones, and they had severe osteoarthritis on that, um, uh, right below the thumb, so this joint right in here, which is quintessential for uh, you know something like hard manual labor. Um, so, um, really, really severe. And I, it was this was the first thing we noticed when we started looking at these at these remains. Um, 
We also noticed um, what are called enthesial changes. So enthesial changes are um, alterations to muscle attachment sites on bone that are, result, that are the result of kind of overuse of that muscle group. Uh, so both severe osteoarthritis and these enthesial changes can be indicative of increased stress on these individuals' bodies, right? The result of potentially agricultural or early industrial work. Um, so there were few, again, few long bones in the sample, um, but both individuals with lower limb bones and pelvic elements present, both of them had these large enthesial changes. You can see this area of really roughened bone that effectively is, so where your muscles attach, your bone gets rugged. The bigger those, the bigger that rugosity, the more rugged it is, the bigger that muscle attachment site is. And so what we're looking at is just like severe overuse of these particular muscle groups. So that's your hip. Um, so that would have been from bending over, squatting, those kinds of things. You might see that in the hip like that. Um, so again, given the fragmentation we see in these individuals, I guarantee you this was not the only sign of poor health in this individual, um, but it was surprising that we saw these enthesial changes in the numbers that we did. Um, the other really startling bit of kind of uh, pathology that we saw on these remains was the, was the signs of poor dental health. Um, after I do this talk, I always like to feel the need to go to the dentist oh, and I apologize. Um, so, uh, there was severe anti-mortem tooth loss. That means tooth loss during life, um, on three of three individuals with, uh, maxilla and mandibles, right? With, with, uh, bones capable of holding teeth. Um, so every individual that we had that had, that could have had teeth, um, had them lost during, um, during life. Anti-mortem tooth loss can be a sign of, um, of old age, but it can also be a sign of severe periodontal disease and severe dental, other dental issues. Um, so we had a whopping one tooth present in the entire sample. Um, you can see it there. Uh, it has severe dental wear and it also is the only, it also has a cavity. So one of one with a cavity, three of three with anti-mortem tooth loss. You guys are getting the picture here, right? Things were not good. Um, so Interestingly, we also have two individuals with something I had never seen before. Um, we had two individuals with what we're calling a temporomandibular joint malfunction or disorder. Um, so the temporomandibular joint is how your jaw articulates, right? Um, and so you can see here, this is the same individual um, on the left and the right side. You can see on this image, that nice hooked temporomandibular joint, right? So that is where your that's where your mandible articulates into the bottom of your skull. That allows us to talk and chew and breathe. Um, and that's nice and hooked. And that's, you, you want that, you want a nice seated socket. The other side of this individual looks like this. Now that should look similar to all that arthritis we were looking at earlier, right? It's pitted, it's lipped. It's also completely flattened. Um, so the mandible would have actually been sliding on that side, right? It wouldn't have been articulating properly. Um, and that's weird enough to see in one individual. And we actually see it in another individual. Obviously this individual is, is fragmentary, um, but you see the same thing going on on that TMJ. Um, now, if you have a sample of eight adults and you have two of them with the same thing going on, first of all, we immediately were like, what the hell is going on, right? So we were like, all right, is this a an injury that these individuals suffer, right? Are they doing the same kind of task that led to the exact same injury? And that seemed a little too far-fetched. We then said, hey, maybe they're genetically related to one another, right? Maybe this is a congenital defect. And we we can't make that assessment, right? They, uh, in turn, we haven't done DNA on these two individuals. And we also, um, skeletally, it's really hard to kind of tell those things, right? Uh, especially from the 1850s. Um, so what we ended up doing is talking to a dentist who was an expert in TMJ issues today. Um, um, right? Go to the experts when you don't know. Um, and so we talked to this TMJ professional, and what we learned is that your your mouth is the system, right? There's teeth, there's muscles, and there's bones. Um, that system enables me to stand up here and yammer at you guys for 30 minutes. It also enables me to eat and breathe and do all these other things. Um, and teeth drive that system is what this dentist told us. So if the teeth fall out or if the teeth have issues, 
then that musculature is going to change and that'll have resultant changes to the skeleton. And so their first question was, did this person lose all their teeth? And we were like, oh, well, we have extreme anti-mortem tooth loss in these samples. Yes, I think they did. Um, and in fact, we do know that um, the mandibles corresponding to both of these had anti-mortem tooth loss. So again, so the, the, the dentist was like, oh, there it is. Your anti-mortem tooth loss is leading to a change in the bite, which is leading to severe osteoarthritis of that temporomandibular joint. Um, to a degree that we thought it was an injury, right? We were we were stumped for a really long time. So to see two of these, I think it's more indicative of just really poor dental health than anything else. Um, so moving on from, um, from the signs of poor dental health, I now wanna turn quickly to these so-called signs of uh, physiological stress. Um, right? So most things that impact skeletal tissue or excuse, are, do so non-specifically. We can't say, ah, yes, this is this disease most of the time. There are a few diseases, yes, that we can say that, but most diseases, most ailments uh, impact us non-specifically, skeletally. Um, things like nutritional deficiencies, childhood illness, various infections, right? We can't see that and say, yes, this is exactly what that is. It impacts our bodies non-specifically. So um, these images, uh, we actually, as you can see, have very few signs of those things. So I actually had no images to show you. Uh, these images are from a contemporary sample from 1850s New Orleans from a poor hospital down there. Um, and so just to give you guys a sense of what these things look like. Um, so I looked at three main signs of so-called physiological stress. The first is what's called periosteal reaction. Uh, that is effectively the ossification, the turning to bone of a membranous sheath that's on the outside of all of our long bones called the periosteum. Um, when we get an infection somewhere in our body, that, that sheath can actually turn to bone. Uh, and we see that in this kind of woven, wiggly appearance that you can see on this, uh, this fibula. Um, we saw only two possible cases of that in the, uh, all of the skeletal remains from this sample. Um, and I say two possible cases. One was on a severely uh, eroded piece of, uh, piece of a femur. Uh, and I just wasn't comfortable making the call that it officially was. And the other was on a fragment the size of my thumbnail. So I say two possible fragments, uh, but, you know, it's really hard to say. Um, periosteal reaction is a sign, as I said, of nonspecific infection. So generalized poor health. Um, we see arguably very little of that in this sample, surprisingly. The second um, sign of physiological stress that I was interested in looking at were linear enamel defects. Linear enamel defects are linear marks on your uh, tooth enamel. Effectively, as you're growing up when you're a child, if you get injured or get an infection or, or a disease, your body goes into freak out mode. And part of that freak out mode is saying, all right, we're going to shut down all this other growth and development. Uh, we're going to stop making, uh, we're going to stop making tooth enamel. And then you get better and that tooth enamel starts growing again. And you actually can see it in the form of a little line, that little, it's a little hiccup in your growth and development. Um, well, can't see any of that in our dental sample because we have the whopping one tooth. So um, unfortunately, that's likely uh, a result of just the, you know, the taphonomic bias of the sample. We just simply don't have teeth. Um, the final uh, piece of nonspecific stress that I'm interested in looking at is what's called parotic hyperostosis or cribra orbitalia. Uh, this is a sign of um, iron deficiency anemias and other kind of nutritional deficiencies as a child. Um, and we actually had a lot of cranial remains and a lot of, uh, of a surprising amount of, of preserved eye orbits uh, where you see these two um, kind of these two patterns of porosity. Um, resulting from this anemia, and we see zero example. Um, now, the interesting thing about uh, parotic hyperostosis and cribra is that it's evidence of childhood stress etched onto adult remains. Um, and so one of the, we might be just, this might just be too small of a sample, it might be too fragmentary, so we just don't see it. Or this suggests that these individuals had not so stressed childhood, childhoods, right? Maybe this indicates institutionalization as an adult and not a lifelong pattern. Does that make sense? Um, but it's, again, really hard to say. Um, again, with such a small, such a fragmentary sample, it's, it's just a challenge. Um, so to wrap this up, um, right, this sample was extremely, uh, 
extremely fragmentary, extremely commingled, severe signs of uh, degenerative joint disease like osteoarthritis, obvious and severe signs of poor dental health. But again, very few other signs of kind of poor health, again, likely resulting from this small fragmentary sample, right? These were the poorest residents of this region. Uh, they could have been things like immigrants or other marginalized groups. They were, we know, subjected to hard labor. They likely had poor diets, as we see. Um, and they also likely suffered from countless other skeletally invisible insults, injuries, or ailments, right? Things that we just can't see on the human skeleton. Um, I wanted to put this slide up here and this image up here. This is one of the few instances where we actually get some individuals' names. And I, it helped me as I was doing this project um, think about these, these bones, these fragmentary remains as people. Um, there is a book called The Paupers of Rockingham County. It is truly a list of paupers from the 1800s in Rockingham County. Um, and I went through and figured out how many of them were from Brentwood and when they were there. Um, interestingly, many of them exist, uh, or many of the, these individuals were uh, housed at Brentwood before the Brentwood poor farm became a thing, which so is kind of a conundrum for me. Um, but again, I, I, I like showing this image because I think it gives some um, some human, it, you know, helps helps us to humanize these individuals, um, right? Again, incredibly fragmentary, incredibly commingled. But I want to using this image. I want to stress that these were people, right? Uh, these are not proxies for past human behavior, like stone tools or like uh, ceramic sherds, right? These are the actual physical remains of lives, uh, and we at our lab try to treat them as such. Um, and they were buried in what was likely either an unmarked or minimally marked burial ground and then forgotten. Um, so by removing these bones from that shelf, from reconstructing their body from the damages of time and taphonomy um, and machinery, right, we begin to let their story be, be heard. Um, and I, I also know that these remains aren't the only ones across the state, across the country, across the world, right? This is a very common problem that we have in bioarchaeology. Um, so part of this conclusion is also partly self-promotion. Um, should you guys at your institutions, universities, have these collections, the Fair Lab deals with them. Please contact us. We will help. Um, so, but rather than end on a soapbox, I actually want to end on some really cool steps forward. Um, so I'm pleased to say that we have recently conducted a small GPR survey to find the bounds of that uh, original burial area. Uh, here you can see Dr. Kelly Moran and Dr. Heather Rockwell uh, doing GPR survey as Nathaniel and I sit back and talk um, and take photos. Um, so they ran GPR um, with the goal of establishing the boundaries for that cemetery so we can pass that along to the county so that it can be protected in the future. Um, I'm super excited to say that the landowner is like utterly thrilled, not only to have us do this work, but also to actually rebury on the property. Um, the pit from the, that these remains were originally uh, found in is actually still visible. So we're going to rebury directly in the pit, um, which we're really excited about. So not only that, the, the homeowner wants to, um, wants to actually protect this in some way after he dies. Uh, you know, he's getting older and he said, I don't want this to happen again. Uh, and for me as a bioarchaeologist, that's a win right there. I, that like, I, I could have been done. Um, and interestingly, he also showed us next to that pit, a large pile of back dirt. Uh, you can just see it off the edge of this photo. We were em embarrassingly have no good photos of the, the pit. He also, uh, the landowner is also keen to have us go out and screen that pile of back dirt for any uh, remains that may have been missed originally. Um, so we actually, this coming weekend, weather permitting, uh, myself, um, myself, some students of mine, and uh, Mark Dobrowski, the state archaeologist, we're going to go out and we're going to actually screen that back dirt and then, um, and then begin the reburial process right there on site. Um, but it's always our goal to get these individuals back in the ground as quick as possible. Um, and I, um, I want to end there, but I, I just want to thank a ton of people. Um, the uh, folks in Brentwood, all of the, the family who we're working with, all of my colleagues, all of my students. I got to tell you, we only have undergraduates in our lab and they are rock stars. I am constantly blown away with how hard they work. Um, they have way more experience at that age than I ever would have had. So um, they were instrumental in doing this in doing this project. Um, so thank you so much. Yep.
Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, do you have any questions? The collection start they all from what the boys found in the relocated earth and dump pool or some recover from the storage tank. There was minimal investigations of the original pit. Dick, you might know or might remember a little bit more, um, but it there it's all from the original. It's all from the one dump. Uh, as far as as far as our records go. Yeah. Was there any uh, assistance from either county or state uh, for any of these towns? Um, so originally they were town endeavors. And then as that became not economically feasible for every town to do this, they became um, county and state facilities. And that occurred, what, early 1900s? Yeah, yeah. And it was different for different counties and, and different regions around New England as well. Um, this is a national phenomenon, but it's really clustered in the northern states. There was, in Deerfield, there was a huge population decline at that same time. And I'm wondering if that's part of the demise. The tax base won't absolutely yeah. There were people there. Totally, yeah, it absolutely could be. You know what? Um, for people who needed a port farm and there was no longer port. Um, they would have gotten sent to the the county ones or the the other the other facilities. These were largely um, many of these individuals were kind of part of a like a large itinerant workforce, so they were moving around already. Um, so yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Echoes of today. Clearly. Yeah. That's a bit the average, but that's it could be much longer than that. Some of the elderly individuals stayed there for their entire lives. They were moving around job to job kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it varied. Um, some people stayed there for much longer. Some people stayed there. You know, there's some accounts from other programs of people literally going for the night. Um, and getting forced to like work the next day and then moving on kind of thing. Then, a follow up, yeah. <laughs> mentioned phases of punishment. Um, is that like a person to person thing, or was that over time? Would that change? Yeah. Um, so the different um, overseers of these poor farms, you know, depending on their attitudes about the poor, their attitudes about their job. Um, they could, you know, their kind of their punishment varied wi widely. Um, so yeah, it's really it's so hard because we see no evidence of violence, overt physical violence on these remains. Right? There's no there's no broken bones. There's no evidence of, of fractures that kind of thing. But again, we have such a fragmentary coming gold sample. I don't know if we we could see it even if it was there. So generally, they were uh, extremely violent. Uh, an extreme, like again, whippings, beatings, isolation. It was a um, a pretty cruel system. The goal was always reformation, um, and and I will say that not also not every one of these individuals were violent. Some of these were true acts of charity that were trying to you know help these people get back on their feet um so the the um the experience of the poor during this time was incredibly variable and that's also a challenge right we don't know necessarily what brentwood looked like right we don't know um all the details of the overseers at brentwood either so it's, it's really hard to get specifics about brentwood and then the system at large across the u.s was super variable so it's it's tricky um but regardless we know that forms of violence were always a part of the system yeah. Um, I'm interested in more of what bioarchaeology is. Um, if I was to look up online, would I go to their lab? Would I, how, how do I find more about this? Absolutely. So unfortunately, we are currently building our website. So, <laughs> um, so we don't have a website right now. Um, so our lab is a split between forensic anthropology and bioarchaeology. So the three faculty that run the lab, we are all trained in human osteology, right? The human skeleton um, and what it can tell us. Two of my colleagues do that to solve or to help medical legal cases, right? Solving um, missing persons cases, uh, death investigations, those kinds of things. Um, we do a lot of work with cold cases uh, 
uh, it, across northern New England. Um, and then I'm at my component of the lab is kind of the, the bioarchaeological side. So it's it's looking at the human skeleton to answer archaeological questions. So um, I am an archaeologist at heart. I just uh, work with, you know, biological materials. I work with the human body. Um, I will certainly help out on those forensic cases, but I that is not my area of expertise. And my colleagues are also trained uh, in archaeological excavation. So we all do it together. We all all of our students get experience doing bioarchaeology and forensic anthropology. Um, and we kind of help guide them depending on their interests. Yeah. Given your sample space was as limited as you were describing, are there other, either locally or regionally or even further, of uh, scholars studying these similar things, uh, similar activities, and and do you have, or did you receive any help with correlations between their research and how you analyze your data? Absolutely. Uh, so the, the, the easy and most fun answer is yes, and that's me. So I actually have uh, my dissertation was all on a similar sample to this uh, from Louisiana. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so this is actually this research is part of a publication um, that just got accepted to American Antiquity. Go us. Go my lab. Um, and in that publication, we actually compare our samples back to other much larger skeletal data sets from other uh, poor farms and poor houses. Um, some of them have as many as 2,000 sets of remains. Um, so m a little bit more statistically robust than our nine. Um, but yeah, that was a big part of this research was comparing back. Um, and we see a lot of, even in our small sample, a lot of similar trends. There's a lot of uh, vertebral osteoarthritis. Um, so a lot of back problems in these populations. Um, we we looked, you know, our our kind of sex ratios, it's three to two, right? We only have five individuals that we could estimate sex for, but that actually tracks with some of these other larger samples. Um, and so we um, we were able to do some some kind of quick and dirty comparisons, even though our sample was so small. So, but there's a, a very robust and continuing to grow. Um, set of, you know, uh, kind of scholarly work on this kind of thing. 